Thanks a million. I'm delighted to, to be able to present this work um, for the society. Um, you know, it's played a big part in, in everything I've done so far as part of my research. So I knew this day would come um, eventually. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, give you an introduction to my PhD research and talk generally, I suppose, um, about cartography in Ireland and um, land of the states um, and how that feeds into the 18th century um, and um, what I'm looking at. So there are really four identifiable pillars for this work and all overlap. They are cartography, land of the states, local history and landscape. And landscape is very much, I suppose, the undercurrent to this work. Um, you know, numerous aspects of landscape will become, become apparent, including the physical and cultural landscapes of the period. Um, the landscape will be explored as it's captured through the map, but other threads running through this project um, include the economic and agricultural landscapes, the cultural landscape of the elite, and to an extent then the vernacular landscape um, and the world of the ordinary people as it was shaped by life on the estates of North Loud. So just to quickly run through um, the project aims, um, what I aim to do really is to assess the role of estate cartography in 18th and 19th century estate management in North County Loud by using estate maps in combination with other estate documents um, to unlock unique insights into land of the states, uh, land of the state histories during the period. And I'll produce a catalogue of the surviving estate maps of North Loud to help me do this. Um, and through this, um, examine how estate cartography coincided with and reacted to wider changes during different phases of landed estate history through the lens of these three North Loud estates. And then I suppose investigate the regional personality of uh, the landscape of North Loud um, through both the, the estates and the maps. And for the most part, the estate lands that um, will be looked at for this project um, lie in the baronies of Upper and Lower Dundalk, so stretching from the area around the town of Dundalk, north to the present county border with South Armagh, Northern Ireland, and eastwards from the Cooley Peninsula to Carlingford Lock. So, um, before arriving at 18th century estate mapping, I'll give a brief introduction to Irish cartography, and um, this will be by no means comprehensive, but um, just to quote John Andrews, uh, who was really the, the leading historian on Irish cartog cartography up until his death a couple of years ago, it is appropriate in considering maps of Ireland to define the cartographer's subject as part of the Earth's surface enclosed by two parallels and two meridians. No portrayal of such a surface on a flat sheet can hope to be totally accurate, and the extent of its inaccuracy depends on the scale of the map and the size of the area represented. So the first known map of Ireland that we have dates to 150 AD, um, and this was made by Claudius Ptolemy of Alexandria, who constructed an outline map of Britain and the island of Ireland. The map references 15 rivers, six promontories and 10 cities, and gives the proximate location of 16 tribes. So much of Ptolemy's geographical data was used until the 16th century. And although we do not know how Ptolemy's information was gathered, um, it was conjectured in the late 19th century that it was probably derived directly or indirectly from merchants who traded in Irish ports. But I suppose you could say, um, surprisingly, that there's a lack of a comprehensive official cartography of Ireland um, within Irish historiography, and this indicates somewhat of an un uneasiness um, to the subject. And it suggests that in many instances, the cartography of Ireland is also the cartography of the British Empire. So some would in fact argue um, that Ireland does not have a history of cartography as such, as there are not many Irish maps and there is no Irish language term for map. But many would date the 16th century as the beginning of the cartographical record with production of early military maps, displaying cities and towns uh, under crown control, and these would have surfaced from the 1520s onwards. So until then, um, Ireland was a feature of maps and atlases, but it wasn't internally mapped. And by European standards, then Ireland would have experienced an unexpectedly late uh, start in terms of cartographic development. So this would have come as no surprise um, as Ireland was too poor, wild and dangerous to be comprehensively mapped. So I'll quickly mention um, a number of key or foundation maps that date to the 16th and early 17th centuries. And many of these had 
derivative effects, I suppose. Um, they were widely accepted and copied until rising standards would elicit something more comprehensive and correct. So in 1567, Robert Lloyd was appointed to construct from personal observation a map of Ireland, or such portions of it as were accessible to him, under the direction and supervision of the Lord Deputy Sir Henry Sidney. Derivatives of Lloyd's maps were circulating in the 1580s, although not under his own name, and he was the source for many printed maps that followed. So during his time in the field, um, Lloyd would have started and ended in Strangford, traversing the country south of a line between Dare and Killary Harbour. Further north then was considered too unquiet. Lloyd was lame and almost blind and in no condition for further field work following his work in Ireland between 1567 and 1571. And then this is an example of one such map um, that would have taken inspiration from Lloyd, John Norden's The Plot of Ireland. Maps were becoming tools for the colonization of Ireland in the 16th century, along with written surveys. So they would have showed the location of castles and um, forts, mountains, lakes and fords. So features on the ground that gave a visual image of the landscape. Um, and then just to mention a contemporary competitor, I suppose, to, to Norden was John Speed. And Speed's The Theatre of the Empire of Great Britain um, in 1611 was described as innovative because it presented a complete sets of county maps for regions of England, Wales, Scotland and Ireland. And the inclusion of Scotland and Ireland helped to constitute Speed's text um, as the visual representation of James I's multinational empire of Great Britain. But it would have been later in the century that Speed's image of Ireland enjoyed its widest circulation. And um, that would have been thanks to distribution the distribution of printed atlases from Amsterdam. So while these maps represent um, a printed tradition of mapping in Ireland, there was also another strand to cartography in the form of manuscript maps. So the earlier plantation maps and surveys then become integral to the su subjects under study here um, in relation to land of the states and the lead up to um, the state cartography. It's been argued that the plantation period between 1560 and 1640 was one in which Irish cartography underwent one of its greatest metamorphoses due to an increased level of interest in Irish affairs by the English crown and government. Through both rebellion and plantation, then maps became an integral part of English administrative practice in Ireland, in turn transforming how maps were used and giving rise to new styles and genres. So assertion of English colonial power um, was in part achieved through the creation of Ireland as an object of knowledge. The extent and endeavours of, endeavors of the English administration in Ireland during the latter 16th and early 17th centuries can be delineated in the manuscript maps found in archival collections across Britain and Ireland. So in the 16th and 17th centuries, map, maps acted as tools of plantation. Um, and as one historian put it, they reflect an attempt to record the change in landscape as it moved from native Gaelic structures to the English ideal of ordered planted estates. Such manuscript maps then produced during the plantation period were produced for specific functions, therefore effectively um, acting as direct instruments for implementing colonial policies. So you would have had surveyors such as Francis Jobson um, in Munster and then Richard Bartlett in Ulster. Um, and this is the example of Richard Bartlett and it was reported by Sir John Davies that unfortunately when he came to Tyrconnell, the inhabitants took off his head because they would not have their country discovered. So again, um, we have to jump back, I suppose, uh, to find the first estate map of Ireland. And this dates to 1598. And it's of Sir Walter Raleigh's lands in Mogili, County Cork, which he leased to Sir Henry Pine. This map was possibly drawn by a John White of Virginia, um, an associate of Raleigh who was known to have lived for a time in County Cork. And stylistically, it's been described as unique, not fitting in with Irish cartographic tradition. So as an outlier, the Mogili map does not define the beginning of a state cartography in Ireland as such, but it is the oldest extant state map that we have. But by the time of Cromwell's arrival in 1649, almost 70% of Irish land was still held by Catholics. So it was a, this was a critical juncture um, also in, this, in the history of cartography and settlement in Ireland. 
So around eight and a half million acres were allocated to a group of nearly um, eight and a half million acres were allocated to a group of nearly 35,000 soldiers and investors as a consequence of the Cromwellian settlement. 3,000 Catholic landowners were forced to transplant to Connacht or else face execution or deportation as a result of Cromwellian policies. But before these proprietors um, could be settled, the forfeitures had to be surveyed. So William Petty um, mapped these forfeitures uh, as well as the entire country down to townland, parish um, and estate with the exception of three counties. So 215 baronies were surveyed including Four and Loud, Loud, RD, Ferrard and Dundalk. The primary purpose of these maps then was to record um, the boundaries of each townland and to calculate their areas with great precision. So the project would have employed around a thousand men mapping Ireland parish by parish, making it um, the first European country to be mapped by a systematic island-wide field, field survey at a scale of 40 plantation purchase to an inch. So, the project demonstrated the incorporation of Ireland um, within the mainstream of European mapping, I suppose. And when we arrive at Sir William Petty's down survey of the 1650s, it's evident that this continued a cartographic tradition rooted in colonization and conquest. And in terms of settlement then, um, the restoration in 1660 would have marked the end of the plantation period and the emergence of a new co uh, colony, I suppose, based on economic exploitation. And you can see also that Loud was mostly reserved um, for the army and adventurers who would have been rewarded for their investment and activities in Ireland during the period. So the map on the left then shows the legacy of earlier waves of settlement in Loud and that of the Pale as well, um, which was Protestant controlled in the 1640s. But if we look north of Dundalk, um, to the lands under study in, in this, uh, for this project, we really see evidence of this historic borderland around Cooley. Um, so although Loud remained relatively untouched by the Elizabethan plantations of the late 16th and early 17th centuries, the north of the county witnessed some key events of the Nine Years' War. And it was in these borderlands then that the Gaelic, the, the Gaelic of, uh, that Gaelic Ulster, sorry, and the English of the Pale met. So Loud would later become engulfed by Cromwellian policies and state endeavours um, throughout the 17th century. And historically and culturally, a region, um, it became a region on the periphery. And some historians of partition even and of the, the present border would argue that the confiscations and settlements of the 17th century were the key markers in the historical partition of Ireland. So it was on these foundations really that the landed estate system was built. And some have argued then that William of Orange's victory in 1691 reinforced rather than created the Protestant ascendancy that was to follow. So in terms of the transfer of land from Catholic to Protestant hands, the Williamite revolution confirmed the work already accomplished by the Cromwellian conquest and confiscations. So following the defeat of the Irish Jacobite army in, 15, in 1691, um, for many Catholics, the choice was to either go into exile on the continent or to remain in Ireland on a, under a government of a victorious yet resentful Protestant minority. And the proportion of land owned by Catholics was reduced from 22% in 1688 to 14% in 1703. So the change was greatest in Leinster and Munster, where a number of Catholics uh, who retained their lands in the post Cromwellian period were deprived of it. So the Cromwellian settlement then um, was really the concluding act, I suppose, in the replacement of a long established native Irish and old English Catholic elite. And these were replaced with a new class of English Protestant planters um, who dominated the political, economic and social order until the great land reforms then of the late 19th century. So in terms of both cartography and land settlements, there were still a number of loose ends that had to be tied up from the Cromwellian settlements um, by the 1680s and 90s. And this was done in the Court of Claims. And the above Robert Richardson map of the lands in Tremiskin is symbolic of this. The Richardson map in the, includes some of the important families um, that would have survived and lost out in 
the final land settlement of the late 17th century in Loud. But stylistically, it's reminiscent of the Down Survey. And within its borders, settlements, churches and dwellings, both small and large, are illustrated. And just to mention as well, there are two other maps um, by Robert Richardson that exist um, or did exist. Um, one is of RD and another um, is of Dundalk. And the one of Dundalk, the only surviving version, was a copy made um, for Dalton and O'Flanagan's history of Dundalk. So a century later then, um, a portion of the, the last map, which, which I showed, um, was copied by John Brownrigg for Chichester Fortescue. And Brownrigg was one of the most well-known estate cartographers of, um, of his time in the late 18th century. So the Richardson map then becomes the starting point for my own study. Uh, it becomes symbolic of cartography's role in laying down the foundations of the estate system of the 18th and 19th centuries. And Brownrigg's co uh, copy of this map really confirms the persistent influence earlier maps had in estate cartography, land ownership, and the landscape throughout the estate period in County Loud. So I'm going to just jump now for a minute um, from cartography into landed estates. Um, and as I have discussed, the emerging elite then were not a completely new community freshly settled in Ireland but they were really a culmination of new settlers and an established people that came out on the winning side in 1691. Consequently, this confirmed their position as the most powerful group in Irish society. Um, the central component of this power was their monopoly over land. So Ireland now entered into a new phase of economic, cultural and social change, which gave rise to the ascendancy and the island-wide network of landed estates. Um, and I'll just mention very roughly, it was a tiered system. So at the top, you would have had the landlords and integral to this system were the middlemen then um, who would have leased large tracts of lands from head landlords. Then you would have had the tenants um, who left from middlemen or head landlords, courtiers who exchanged labour for small land parcels and landless labourers who worked on estates or farms. And we really have an example of all these across the estates in North Loud. So we must... I suppose, look at events um, related to land ownership in the run-up to the 18th century, um, particularly following the Cromwellian and William White Wars and the acts of explanation and settlement uh, before we can grasp um, the landscape that emerged in the 18th century. And maps then can be used as a means to both tell the story of the birth of landed estates in Loud and also for understanding the arrival and evolution of estate cartography. So we must understand um, that the consolidation of this estate system and the vast social and political changes in the early 18th century then generated a demand for a new sort of cartography to emerge. And just to mention, um, the big house then became a symbol of the social and economic dom dominance of the landed class. And just to, to quote Owen Perdue, the big house held a position at the centre of rural life just as it stood physically at the center of the estate of which it was the heart. The house embodied the dominance and grandeur of the rural landscape. But just to make the point then that my own study is not one of the big house or of the elite, but it's a study of the, the landed estates, um, landed estate management and the personality of the region of North Loud through those estates um, and through the maps. And then going into then um, the estates, under study here, you could argue that these estates were perhaps the most influential in North Loud, and um, certainly north of Dundalk. But it's important, and um, but importantly for the purpose of of my own study, they remained largely intact throughout the 18th and early 19th centuries, and this accommodates then a more thorough assessment of them and of the region throughout the period. So, um, a historical dichotomy then would have existed in the region under study, which I which I touched on, um, and this involved as well the physical, social and economic situation, um, which made this area and its estate somewhat different. So there was contrast between the richer clay plains farmed by privileged tenants um, and then the localities which occupied physically marginal situations. So the profile of these three estates, the Tipping Estate, the Anglesey Estate and the Fortescue Estate, give a good example of those found in the literature. Um, 
relating to the subject. So you would have had a tipping estate, which was small to middling. And this is an example of the sort of, of estate, perhaps not given as much attention um, within Irish historiography. Then you had the Anglesey estate, which was an absentee estate. Um, and this would have had differences in management policies and the economic and social conditions of the tenants um, as a result of it being an absentee estate. And then the fourth skew estate, which was the largest and I suppose the wealthiest um, and consisted of five branches at one stage before being reunified in the mid 19th century. So the fourth skew estate has also been chosen um, for a comparative study um, the maps and management policies of the lands just south of Dundalk can be compared to how the Fort Skew lands in Cooley um, were managed and treated. And this variety then enables a more comprehensive assessment of estate management and estate cartography, as we have multiple categories of estates to compare. So just to mention as well, um, there were also smaller neighbouring estates that haven't made as much of an imprint, I suppose, on the historical record. But they become visible as well on the maps um, and within you know the estate collections even these three estate collections so in some instances they also come into play if we're looking at the the entire landscape of um north loud and um as i mentioned these lands really fall in between the towns of newry and dundalk and we have an urban example as well in carlingford which is important to Cooley. um but in some ways, not to the wider area of North Loud, as it's largely bypassed from the middle of the 18th century. So this would have had economic and social impacts that affected the estates in question and the region. But trade, industry and um, communications are some of the themes that will be studied in the context of the estates and through the maps as they emerge um, as subjects of the maps themselves, really. So these are some examples um, of how we can tell the story of the families as well and the states as they emerge from the 17th century. So on the left is a map of the Anglesey estate lands and down. And although it dates to 1837, it's telling of the earlier wills and land grants dating back to Sir Nicholas Bagnall in 1552. The Bagnall estates were divided between cousins and um, George Needham um, and the Needhams later became Earls of Kilmory and Edward Bailey. The latter were granted the seat, the seat in Plas Newit in Anglesey in Wales um, and the estates in Cooley. But the Baileys also retained lands um, in Down and we have maps and surveys of these lands that very much show evidence of continuity regarding land ownership and settlement in the region dating as far back to the 16th century. So the Tipping Estate then unlike other estates in North Loud, was more or less confined to Belurgan um, and the Cooley Peninsula. And the seat of the Tipping family was Belurgan Park. And this was built around 1740. The Tipping estate then could perhaps be classified as a middling estate. Um, it never amounted to more than 3,000 acres. And in 1666, Thomas Tipping was granted lands in Westmead and down under the Acts of Settlement and Explanation. And the first documentary evidence that we have um, for the Tipping family in Ireland is a copy of this patent. Then in 1723, Thomas Tipping of Castletown bought the lands of Bullorgan, Ballyboy Moor and Ballyboy Beg, now in the barony of Lower Dundalk. And these lands contained around 890 Irish acres and were purchased from the trustees of Cape Moor, son of the Earl of Drogheda. Um, and then in 1728, Thomas bought the interest of a John Morrish. So the Cooley estate um, was then also purchased from the Stannis family around the same time, who I'll mention a little bit later on. And the map on the right is a 1720 map of the Hill estate in Strangford. So these lands also came into possession of the Tipping family through marriage at one stage. And while these maps tell the story of the family um, and you know these family networks, this one in particular is also an example of the er of early estate cartography and the last invisible influence of the down survey. And just to mention quickly as well, the Fortescue family in Loud, um, which is perhaps the most complicated to trace as there were essentially five branches at one stage. The Fortescue line in Ireland begins with faithful Fortescue who came to Ireland um, at a very young age with his uncle, Sir Arthur Chichester at the beginning of the 17th century. 
on the latter's appointment as Lord Deputy. So Sir Faithful obtained lands in Antrim, Down and Loud, and in 1635 he obtained a lease of the Manor of Dromiskin and other lands from Archbishop Hampton. And this property never reverted back to the church. Um, so we arrived then at the 18th century and it becomes clear that the landscape um, was very much transformed socially, politically and economically. Um, after the down survey and the final allocation of estates in the 1690s, there was no central government involvement in mapping. Um, and there wasn't then until the 19th century with the ordnance survey. So mapping was to become a competitive private enterprise with an expanding market. So while almost all the maps produced in previous centuries were produced by foreigners, um, Irish men now became prominent um, and their names are recorded on the thousands of manuscript estate maps that exist now in estate collections. The landlords and agents were interested in who held land, its location, um, and the quality and quantity of the holdings. So surveyors were commissioned by landowners to survey and map estate lands. Surveys and maps then often relate to other key events in the history of the estate, land sales, purchases, um, leases, improvements, land disputes, and so on. And that's really what um, I suppose I'm trying to tap into uh, with these maps in the context of North Loud and the three estates under study. And some surveyors and maps um, were actually ornamental, but just to make the point that most were functional. So to the historian then, maps offer an opportunity to explore how the landscape may have changed um, in particular regions such as North Loud. And they can tell us about some of the in intricacies um, of the development of rural settlement in Ireland. They can tell us about economic and social development and allow us to study the physical characteristics of the landscape, um, which offers suggestions to the social and economic conditions of the landlord who would have owned the land. So the map can be explored as an instrument in land and estate management, and its potential in this hasn't really been fully utilised by historians. And you can see visually that many such maps contained, um, you know, recorded the likes of archaeological features that persist or may have been lost in the landscape. Um, such as the above inclusion of forts or rats at Belurgan. Um, so in the context of local history, I suppose they're really invalu invaluable. Um, and just to mention as well, the maps show features not physically present on the ground, such as boundaries and place names. And the preoccupation of the surveyors was with town land, boundary delineation and the calculation of acreage. And the maps would have varied in size, scale, um, and content. So this is an example of the type of maps um, being explored through this work. Um, there are 68 maps that I've catalogued so far for these three estates, and there's no doubt that more exist. Um, and this is just a sample of the type of maps. So we have boundary maps, urban property maps, road maps, domain maps, mill maps, lease maps. Um, so just to make the point then, there's such a range of maps that they can't be forcibly categorized and that's something that I've tried not to do. Um, but just to make the point, they can be used thematically through case studies to tap into life on the estates and the changes taking place in the region at certain points in time. And it's really trying to piece together then the narrative of these estates and the region of North Loud by digging into these maps and these themes that emerge through the maps and that would have led to landscape change and how people lived and worked on the estates. And this is just a, a rough distribution um, of the lands contained within these maps. So um, this is by no means of the entirety of the estate lands, um, but from the maps that I've catalogued, um, you can see the orange pins there are um, maps of the, the Anglesey lands. The green then is the tipping uh, estate, which would have been more or less confined to in and around Belurgan, as you can see. And then the fourth askew estate is red. And again, just to make the point, um, can really compare and contrast then the fourth askew lands just south of, of um, Dundalk and how these would have compared with the lands north of Dundalk. And I must also bring um, attention to the profession 
um, the evolving profession of land surveying dating back to the early 18th century. So these would have been the men who made the maps um, and they range from full-time to part-time surveyors. Some were even school teachers who were skilled in basic arithmetic and their basic instruments for surveying were the chain, um, which was used for horizontal, horizontal measurement and the circumferenter, which was an instrument used for um, plotting angles. So to quote one historian then, maps were the product of a significantly larger process behind which was a profession revolving around observational networks, mathematical projections, pre precision instruments, and commercial ingenuity. Surveyors defined the bound value and location of these lands and the maps became tools for the control, sale, and leasing of land. And although this isn't an estate map, I just wanted to point out um, the more artistic title pages or cartouches that you come across often show the surveyor in the field um, with the inclusion of surveying instruments, such as this example um, of, of Matthew Wren's map of County Loud from 1766. So the earlier 18th century estate maps then tended to lack um, much uh, topographical detail and visual, visually and stylistically, again, they resembled the earlier down survey um, and the trustees survey. And it's worth pointing out um, that this would have been a period that the landscape of North Loud was still recovering from the upheaval of the 17th century. So while these maps are basic, um, they often record, you know, defunct um, townland names and, and boundary changes or boundaries excuse me, that were, um, that changed over time. So as the estates themselves then um, became more prosperous by the mid 18th century, the gentry spent lavishly and the con concept of order and improvement meant that there was a growing demand for maps. So ornamental maps um, and map books then were becoming a source of pride for the landlord. Around the 1750s, a number of events that took place that impacted the state cartography in Ireland. And I'll first mention this. Um, so Robert Gibson's Treatise of Practical Surveying, which really contributed um, to the training of surveyors and its access accessibility meant that Irish surveyors now had a general surveying manual and its release was significant for the more local and regional practitioners in Ireland. But it was really the maps of John Roke um, and Bernard Scale. So the ornamental estate atlases, decorative cartouches and artistic title pages that have been at the forefront of work carried out on Irish estate mapping to date. So with the progress then of landscape change and um, by the middle of the 18th century, these mere outline maps, which I, I showed a couple of minutes ago, um, were losing justification and the landlords then sought something more detailed so the coming of John Roque, um, an Irish, an Anglo-French cartographer, sorry, really changed Irish mapping drastically. So in just six years, he revolutionized the state cartography with his attention to detail, his artistic style, um, which many others drew inspiration from and sought to emulate. A lineage of surveyors then can be traced to Roque, most notably his brother-in-law and pupil Bernard Scale. And a picture emerges of Roque as one of the great innovators of map making in Ireland, as his French skill, as it became known, um, was still distinguishable three generations later. And we have some examples of the French skill in North Loud, um, such as the above Bernard Scale map of Dundalk the Main, which was produced for the Earl of Clan in 1777. And it's also maps such as these uh, frame maps of Belurgan that show a distinct connection um, to the transformation um, brought about by the coming of the French school. But it's not fair, I suppose, to, all, to say that all of the maps um, found in North Loud and even across the country were as um, pretty, I suppose, as, as these ones. Um, most remain functional. Um, and for the most part, they were less decorative. So while some decorative and elaborate maps exist in North Loud, such as the above, um, the fact that many were not the grand surveys of the likes of John Roke um, and you know, them sort of atlases may be reflective of the makeup of the, the estates in North, in North Loud. Um, 
And we can kind of say, I suppose, that these estates were ones that didn't fit in uh, with those generically portrayed in landed estate histories and that narrative, such as those in other parts of the county. And I suppose um, you could say that North Loud was not necessarily a region of big houses. So as I mentioned, most maps were functional um, and lack you know, specific features and details. And in some ways, this is why there hasn't been much work carried out on them to date by historians. They display simple plot boundaries, um, acreage, tenants' names, and the quality of such maps vary enormously in regard to accuracy. So the lack of characteristics and details um, lead me on to my approach in reading the map. And I'll talk about that a bit in a second. Um, maps such as the above um, plot map of Liss Lee can be difficult to study. And what I'm really trying to do is catalogue these maps um, and in doing that, place them in their wider context and employ contemporary sources um, to try and make better sense of them and use them as a lens into lesser explored areas of estate histories. We can then see um, what events were taking place on the Loud Estates that led to these maps being commissioned. And also, um, my present research is very much archivally driven, and I just want to point out the sources that can be used together with the map to tell us about you know, the maps themselves, I suppose, um, as well as the landlords, the tenants, the agents, and so on. So the likes of the counts and receipts, agents' reports, valuations, correspondence, wills, tenants' petitions, and rent rolls. And within these sources is a wealth of information related to local history and genealogy. Um, so for example, place names, physical features in the landscape, family names, property ownership, and clues as to the social fabric um, of a region. So that's really what I'm trying to tap into by looking beyond um, you know, a textual or a visual reading of the map and using these other sources um, to help play, place the map in its social and historical context. And in many ways, kind of have to do that with a lot of the estate maps as they do lack um, you know, topographical detail, if you like. And there's much uh, potential in the likes of accompanying valuation books that give the value of the land based on the condition of the soil um, and also the amount of land held. Also rental books that record payments made by tenants um, yearly or half yearly and how much rent was payable. So these can often be corrob corroborated with the maps and in some ways bring to life the tenants on the estates and um, really humanizing them as often um, within landed estate histories um, become anonymous and as well in the estate archives. So if you're someone who's interested in genealogy, your family history as well, I definitely encourage you to consult these collections um, as they do contain a wealth of, of information. But then where the maps don't exist, um, there's still evidence of cartographic act activity. Um, this can be investigated still. So. These are entries uh, on maps and surveys from the 18th century account books of the Anglesey estate. And we really see the boom in the 1760s, which coincided with those wider trends in estate cartography. So we have um, the first estate map recorded is 1716, and then there's a gap to 1765. And that's by no means to say that there weren't other maps commissioned within this period. Um, but we also see changes then in estate management as James Rooney, um, who was the agent for the Anglesey Estates in Ireland, died in, 15, in 1756, and John Hutchison then succeeded him. So it becomes clear that some agents and landowners were quicker to commission surveys and maps than others. And I just want to show a couple of examples um, of what we can learn from the maps and other materials in relation to the local landscape. So we get glimpses into the relationship um, of neighbour and landowners and the relationships they had with each other and how they co cooperated with each other and um, came to agreements or often commissioned maps for encroachments and damage to each other's property, um, which often actually ended up in court. So this is a letter from James Wolfe McNeil um, to a representative of the Tipping Estate. And this reads, on the other side, you have a rough sketch of the alteration of the road leading from Ravensdale to Ballymiscanlan Bridge 
a measured improvement of mill dam YX, which will not altogether take up more than half an acre or three rooms of land. Between the tail run of the mill and the river on the loud side of Ballymascanlan Bridge, I expect, if Mr Tipping will give me his accommodation, to have a considerable sum of money laid out in creating a flour mill which will benefit his estate and give employment to a number of his tenants. So we then see um, how the map was commissioned and used as an official document, I suppose, um, which laid down the bounds and measurements of the lands granted for the building of McNeil's Mill in this case. Um, so, you know, with the wider estate collections, we can really look at the processes leading up to these changes um, and the production of these maps. And another interesting map um, is this. This is undated and unsigned. But the account books for the Anglesey estate tell us that it was produced by a John Misty in 1783. The subject of this map is Mr. Stannis, um, and the Stannis family were a significant family in Carlingford in the 18th century. But there aren't many records of them, um, and this was commissioned due to an encroachment made by Ephraim Stannis on Nicholas Bailey's estate. And it was actually, um, this encroachment was made um, on lands that were in the possession of John Hutchinson, who was the Anglesey estate agent at the time. Stannis wrote then in January 1783, I understand I have misrepresented to you as encroaching on your lordship's property in this country, particularly in respect to the mill of Grange and the water course leading thereto, and as it would make me very unhappy that you should conceive an impression to my disadvantage, I hope you will pardon the liberty I now take in addressing you and informing your law agent by sending him abstracts of every deed in my possession relative to the property of that mill so that Mr. Lambert might comprehend the whole case at one view and acquaint your lordship with the particulars on the whole. So we can actually explore, um, I suppose, the individuals and events that are also on the periphery, um, if you like, of the actual estates under study um, and the lesser explored subjects and themes then come through um, in the likes of these unassuming maps, I suppose. And we also have some surveyors that become familiar um, and often work regionally or were re-employed by the same landowner or agent. So we see the same names coming up in loud, such as the Frains, who are actually, they were from Monaghan, um, but they would have surveyed um, for a number of landowners in loud. And um, just to mention, surveying then was also uh, a family profession. So we have a lineage of surveyors from the same family, such as James and John Frayne. And although some of these illustrations, through some of these illustrations that you can see on the screen, um, the more artistic ones, I suppose, we get a snapshot then of the agricultural and social landscape of the estates with the depictions of uh, houses and the likes of farming implements. But surveying was difficult work, um, and I, I want to mention the surveyors just for a moment. Um, it was physical work, and it greatly depended on, you know, the likes of the weather. Um, so to use this example, then, we have seven maps made by a surveyor, Richard Kendrick of Dundalk. And Kendrick mapped both the Tipping and Fortescue estates, and he was active in Loud and Mead. And although a few of his maps actually survive, um, Kendrick employed one of Ulster's best known land surveyors, James Williamson, and encouraged Williamson to practice surveying on his own, selling them a circumferenter at a bargain price. So while Kendrick's entry in Sarah Bendel's Dictionary of Land Surveyors says he was active from 1776, the earliest reference we have to Kendrick's maps in Loud actually comes from himself um, and a map surveyed of Killali in the upper half barony of Dundalk. Um, and this was part of John William Foster's estate. And this was signed by Kendrick and dated August 1784 and quote, copied by me in the year 1771. So this means that Kendrick was actually active and loud from at least 1771. And while the existing maps um, relating to Kendrick are small plot maps or copies, um, there's evidence to show that Kendrick mapped entire estates and produced map books. On January 20th, 1777, Kendrick made a proposal to survey the Tipping Estates in Loud and Armagh. He said, I propose to survey Edward Tipping Esquire's estates in the counties of Loud and Armagh 
and to give a general map at three pence per acre and to make a book of maps with, uh, with the general map for three guineas. Um, two years later, then we get a clue as to the hardships of the profession, I suppose. Kendrick was again working for the tippings and wrote to Mr. Johnson, as the wind is so high, it would be impossible to survey today. I have sent John with the contents of Dawes and Toner's land, took in by the new wall. Also, if there's anything to be done at Mr. Tipping's, you'll be so kind as to show him, which shall be done the first fine day. And um, as well, uh, just this, this letter from Kendrick shows really the, the hardships that some of these surveyors would have endured. So he wrote, uh, Dear Sir, I enclose you here the return of Earl's Quarter. I have had a very severe fit of the gout since I seen you last, or you should have had the return sooner. I'm obliged to go into the county mead tomorrow on some very particular business. I shall return in a few days, and then we'll let you know the day I can meet you at Bullurgan. So this, these are just some examples, um, I suppose, from the material that I'm looking at. And um, cartographic activity like this, certainly from the evidence in North Loud, continues at steady pace until the 1840s and early 1850s. And it's true, um, you know, this cartographic output that we can dig deeper into the estate histories and the landscape of the region. But it doesn't come to an, an immediate halt. Um, so with the emergence of, uh, the emergence of the engineering profession um, as a result of, you know, industrial activity um, around the time of the mid 19th century, um, we see maps being signed by civil engineers, such as the above by local engineer, poet and Gaelic scholar, um, Matthew Moore Graham. But there's then a blurring of the lines, if you like. These maps employed the help of the Ordnance Survey maps. Um, and those making the maps were from other professions, such as Graham. The decline in estate maps then um, and estate sur surveying really coincided with numerous factors. And primarily that was the colossal undertaking of the National Survey of Ireland from the late 1820s onwards. So in some ways, um, the Ordnance Survey undercut the need for private surveys due to its accuracy, um, its availability and the affordability of these um, Ordnance Survey sheets. So, you know, while its achievements were extraordinary, um, the six inch and particularly the 25 inch Ordnance Survey maps signaled the phasing out of private estate cartography. But this was only one element um, in the wider external forces at play. So this map as well is interesting, um, and we can compare it to older maps of the Bullurgan estate, including the Ordnance Survey maps. And we see in this map that a number of plots are subdivided um, where they were not at the time of the frame maps of uh, 1816 and 1817. Um, so we can trace back um, as well and see these landscape changes um, you know, visually, and then we can dig deeper into why these were actually taking place. So um, two years after Graham's Belorgan map, Edward Tipping applied to the encumbered estates court to clear debts, debts um, of more than 16,000 pounds. And by doing so, he was able to maintain ownership of his lands at Belorgan. So, um, the subdivision of the main lands at Bullurgan then um, reflects the changes taking place for the land loan owners uh, in the region and I suppose gives a clue as to the financial difficulties they were in at the time um, and what they were doing, you know, to, to really change their financial situation and um, through the management of their estates and the lands that they had. And ultimately, you know, there was a long decline um, of landed estates. They were no, no longer financially viable for numerous reasons, such as debt, and um, obviously the famine changes in agricultural practices and the land reforms then, and um, particularly in the later 19th century. You would have also had the Devon Commission and um, the encumbered estates court, the Great Famine and the Land Acts, um, as I mentioned. Um, and these were just some of the major events, I suppose, that transformed land ownership in Ireland and the political, cultural and economic landscape. But just to make the point that consequently, um, as in the past, 
cartography really reacted to the wider political, cultural and economic changes that were taking place in Ireland under the empire. Um, but albeit now um, this was happening with the use of the Ordnance Survey and without the private state surveyors and their estate maps that had dominated Irish cartography in the 18th and first half of the 19th centuries. So my work then ends, I suppose, with the phasing out of land of the state mapping um, in the late 1840s and early 1850s, which was intertwined with this long decline and fragmentation of the estates themselves. So I just want to finish with this quote as well um, by John Andrews, a map is always smaller than a subject. And uh, really this sums up the potential of looking beyond the maps as mere visual um, or, or technical documents, if you like. So by placing the map in its historic and, cult and social context, um, we can unlock new perspectives on its subjects and the regions and estates under study. So thanks very much for um, staying with me.